Hello everyone and welcome back to Solid State Physics in a Nutshell, brought to you by the Physics Department at the Colorado School of Mines. I'm Eric. And I'm Nicole. Today we're going to take a closer look at our scattering density N of R. Last time we looked at elastic diffraction and developed an expression for the intensity at our detector that depended on N of R and the change in our wave vector K. And in that process, remember, we made no assumptions about the form of N of R. We could have stuck in a crystal, glass, even a liquid into our diffractometer, and this expression for intensity would still hold. But N of R is pretty important since it contains all the structural info of the material we're studying. Indeed, and so to that end, our goal is to build up an expression for N of R for an infinitely periodic solid. From there, we'll use translational symmetry to place constraints on this expression, so by the end of the video, we should have a well-defined N of R. But if all we care about is intensity, we could just solve for N of R from electronic calculations and then do a numeric integration to get intensity, right? We could. However, we ultimately want an analytic expression because in practice you want to go from an intensity spectrum and solve backwards for the scattering density. Okay, that makes sense. So we're starting with a crystal that's infinitely periodic in all directions, and ultimately we want to get to an analytic expression for intensity. So rather than trying to integrate over an entire sample volume, like in the intensity equation, wouldn't it just be easier to choose a periodic form for N of R? Yeah, it would. But what periodic function should we use? I don't know. But, but that's okay, because I know any periodic function can be built using a combination of other periodic functions, like sines and cosines. But because there might be complex components, We'll build N of R as a summation of complex exponentials that are summed over this vector G. And really, this vector G business represents the Fourier space that we build our wave in. But remember, we began with an infinitely periodic solid. Now that we have this sum, we need to constrain G so that our N of R expression still satisfies this translational symmetry. And for that to occur, N of R plus our translational vector T, which we introduced last week, should equal N of R. Plugging R plus T into our Fourier series and separating the exponentials, we get the following. From Euler, we know that e to the i times 2 pi times some integer is always 1. So if g dot T equals 2 pi times some integer m, translational symmetry is maintained. Only a subset of points contained in the sum satisfies translational symmetry. Thus, like the lattice in real space, we can think of Fourier space as a set of discrete points. And each point has an associated Fourier coefficient, n sub g, that determines that particular point's contribution to the total scattering density. Then, like our translation vector t, g is made up of three vectors, g1, g2, and g3, with integer prefactors h, k, and l. Please note that in Cattell, these integer prefactors are v1, v2, and v3. But nobody other than Cattell would ever use v1, v2, and v3, so we're sticking with h, k, and l in this class. So now that we have an expression for g and t, we can sub both into the dot product constraint we had before. And this suggests we choose our g vectors such that g sub i dotted with a sub j is 2 pi times the Kronecker delta, where it equals 1 when i equals j, and 0 otherwise. Plugging this into our expression above, we see that every term is 2 pi times some integer. And with that g dot a constraint, we can determine our g vectors in terms of our real space lattice vectors. Because g sub i dot a sub j is always zero, we know that g1 is perpendicular to a2 and to a3, and so should point in the direction of a1. Mm, not quite. That's only true for cubic systems. More generally, we should think of g1 pointing in the direction of a2 cross a3, which may or may not be parallel to a1. Combining this with a scaling factor of 2 pi over the volume of our cell, and we get the following expression for g1. 
G2 and G3 can be obtained similarly, except the subscripts in the cross product are different. And we can see that we've satisfied our original G sub J dot A sub I condition, because if I take G1 and dot it with A1, I get back 2 pi. Eric mentioned the scale factor went inversely with the cell volume. So a bigger cell in real space is a smaller one in our Fourier space, which is why it's sometimes referred to as reciprocal space. Just a heads up that the two are one and the same. So at this point, it looks like we have a well-developed expression for n of r. From assuming that an infinite periodic solid, we built a Fourier series out of complex exponentials that contained this Fourier space vector, g. And constraining g and its constituent vectors in terms of the real space lattice vectors ensure translational symmetry was satisfied and led us to explicit expressions for g1, g2, and g3. But we never talked about how to solve for the Fourier coefficients n sub g. We will be addressing this in detail next time. Until then, let's look at a simple example. Imagine layers of graphene stacked like so in the g3 direction. We can imagine then that to first order, our n of r can be approximated as a sine wave. So since a simple sine wave can be built out of one wave, all my Fourier coefficients but one will be zero. Yeah, so we can then describe the g3 periodicity of this graphite stack in terms of a single wave vector with an associated Fourier coefficient n sub g sub hkl. We leave you today with some conceptual questions regarding Fourier space. First off, where does the space spanned by g exist, and is it infinite? Why or why not? It might help to think about its units. And second, because we've been talking about diffraction, what can we say about the magnitude of g compared to the wavelength that we diffract in our sample? All right, thanks for watching Solid State Physics in a nutshell. Next time, Nicole and I are going to finally get you to an analytic expression for intensity from elastic diffraction. See you then.